We'll never go back to, quote, normal, because whatever touches us, teaches us. I invested in them, and the end result was blue buffalo dog food, cat food, which was eventually sold for billions of dollars. If you've ever heard of Flash, that was my company. Billions of dollars of value was created. Do you find a need and you fill it? Well, I had the need to save my daughter. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the show that's all about entrepreneurs, small businesses, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. And who's on the show today? Tonight, we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Gilda Carl, who's an internationally renowned relationship expert. And then after that, we have Jim Barod introducing uh, Len Green, who's going to be talking about financial issues for entrepreneurs. And his own journey, too. And... I am so excited about these people and the two presenters that we have today. This stuff is awesome. You're not going to hear about this first one very many other places, probably. It's instigate.ai. It's artificial intelligence for the everyday person with a really fun way to use it. Artificial intelligence for the everyday person. That sounds interesting. And then after him, uh, do you want to be able to save a life, save a choking victim? Well, you have to see what Arthur Lee has because... This is amazing. And they've saved 88 lives already at, and counting. That's, that is amazing. So, but before we get to our honored guests, what do we have in the world of IP to talk about? Okay, this is a real patent palooza. <laughs> Microsoft apparently has filed for a patent and I found this on BBC News Online. And I think that if they do patent this and anybody uses it, that it is going to drive a lot more corporate people into starting their own businesses. <laughs> Yay is. for that. <laughs> <laughs> it is. They set up sensors around a conference room and they monitor the body language and facial expressions of people in a meeting listening to a presenter. As if it's not enough stress already to make a but, presentation, they have to monitor they, the way that uh, everybody's <laughs> reacting. But that do they sound great? No, do they use this to say, uh, "Hey, you people on on tape, grow up and listen to"? No, they use this to rate the presentation, and that they can do it on so on remote ones too. Stress. <laughs> Are they going to make imagine. the CEO who implements this? <laughs> go so, through this process too so i think that's only fair it's just a filed application it could become a patent will oh, corporate use it um, absolutely they will i'm <laughs> I totally know. convinced it's a few years down the they're road they're going to be putting but... this on your in your home i mean alexa is going to have cameras next right they want to see how you react to their tv programs right so uh stay tuned good old microsoft we love them so on to the next so our next topic involves uh, a very famous basketball player named LeBron James. And all of you who follow basketball know that LeBron James is referred to often as King James. And so King James was also the subject of a trademark that was filed by Carnival Cruise Line. And Carnival fought for this trademark for King James, presumably for ships, right? And they fought for it for over 15 months. And the day after it was granted, uh, LeBron James filed a trademark opposition to it, claiming that he had superior rights to the King James name. So um, within three or four days of uh, filing this opposition, Carnival just completely dropped the trademark. And I guess it's because they didn't really want to get into a public spat with LeBron James, right? So um, I think it's kind of an interesting case because even though legally, he may have, uh, Carnival may have been entitled to the trademark. They realized that the common sense decision was av av avoiding a fight with King James. So that's the- with James LeBron. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple points I want to bring up for people that don't know a lot about trademarks. One is what is an opposition and how do you use it quickly? So an opposition is just at the end of the trademark registration process, after the examiner grants the trademark, somebody can file a paper at the trademark office to contest that registration, which is what LeBron James did. And if it goes on, then it's like a little mini trial at the trademark office. Um, and so hopefully, if you've done a good tra trademark search, 
then you'll know that uh, there are other actors out there that could potentially file an opposition. And you just have to be prepared either to fight or you have to look for a name that's not going to cause problems. And so. if you want to file one, you have to know the registration came through and you have only 30 days, right? Right. And so there's so. companies that monitor trademarks that get granted from the trademark office. And if something's too close to your mark, then you'll be able to see it. And then if you want to file an opposition, you can do that too. So that's point one. So point two, we don't know if LeBron James had a trademark. Let's just say he did just for the sake of argument. How could two different entities get the same trademark? Well, it, it does happen all the time. So if it's a famous mark, and we would assume that LeBron James's name is famous, just like Coca-Cola is famous, they give wider scope of protection to trademarks that are famous than marks that are not famous. And so if it's a less famous mark, you can have the same mark for different types of goods or services. So the famous case about this is uh, Lexus versus Lexus, Lexus for cars, versus Lexus for legal services, it's a database. And the court ruled that even you can have the same name, but as long as they're for different goods and they don't, uh, and they travel in different channels of commerce. So the point, point is, is that if you are thinking about registering a trademark, you really need to get with a patent professional who can walk you through all of these things and so that you have a high chance of being successful. And the other moral of the story is don't fight with uh, King <laughs> LeBron James. So there you go. So that was fun, but now we get to the juicy part. So. Yes, so our guest this evening will be Dr. Gilda Carl. Dr. Gilda is the only internationally known relationship expert. And as evidence, she has authored 18 books, including Don't Bet on the Prince, How to Have a Man you want by betting on yourself. And this was a test question on Jeopardy. And she's also served as a product spokesperson for Hallmark, Match.com, and made numerous TV appearances, actually too many to name here. And she has her own show currently in development. So welcome, Dr. Gilda. So nice to have you on the program. Thank you for inviting me. This is so nice to see you guys. Well, it's great to see you too. So Right now we're in the middle of a COVID epidemic and uh, that's having a, a lot of effects on a lot of relationships. Um, but I'm kind of curious, how does the COVID epidemic affect business relationships? Oh, it affects them terribly because people who have never been on television before are suddenly put into this configuration that <laughs> new Hollywood squares that everybody has to be on, constantly on, and people are exhausted. People are just driven to, to do things that they ordinarily would not do. So um, we're waiting, hopefully, until we can go back to normal, but we'll never go back to quote normal because whatever touches us teaches us. And so we will never go back we will have this much greater wisdom and we'll be able to apply it to all our relationships, hopefully in a much better way. Well, that's uh, very profound. So what do you think some of the effects are? How do you think it's going to change us going forward? Well, I'm actually doing all of this research now for my new book uh, that hasn't even been published yet. Uh, because what do you do when you have COVID all around you? You write <laughs> more books and more books. I'm in the middle of three more. So um, what happens is that people find themselves on air who have never been on air before and they're fatigued. There is a new, new dysfunction that people are pointing to called uh, Zoom fatigue video call fatigue. People are just exhausted. And a lot of people are saying that they don't know how much longer they can take it. They are begging their companies to go back to normal, normal, whatever that's supposed to mean, the normal emails and the telephone calls about which they were all complaining. <laughs> 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 really tremendous as a as a contrast uh i go into companies and i do all this uh corporate consulting communications consulting and media training and i am telling first of all 
everything has been switched to online. Now that may be sounding horrible, but one of my clients actually said he was so grateful for this because he was entrepreneurial and he ended up inter interacting with some guy from a foreign country. This was the only way they could have done their business. And he ended up with a six figure contract because of the interchanges that I taught him how to uh, project. And, and this is a tremendous skill and we are never going away from this anymore because companies have already told some of their uh, employees, you will never have to come back to our offices anymore. We are closing down our offices when we need you to, to meet together. Mm -hmm. We will rent space, but they no longer want to have to pay for their tremendous rentals of these office facilities. And that's very interesting because it has a domino effect on our entire economy. So how this is going to play out, I don't know. But in the meantime, people are personally stressed and distressed. They don't know where to turn. They haven't all had the training to project themselves on camera online, they have no idea what they're doing. And some of the meeting planners don't know what they're doing either because they, the meetings are too long. These are all the complaints that people are making. The meetings are too long, they, they're too exhausting. People go on and on. People are talking over one another. <laughs> up. And we're not talking about the fact that you know, the kids are barging in the room and the dog is barking and the phones are going off because of deliveries you're expecting, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and what's more, we found that they are spending one hour more on average working and working and working. And if you're an entrepreneur, as everybody on this show is, you know that you're working 24 seven anyway. I see clients, I see clients here uh, on Hollywood squares. I see them on Saturdays and Sundays in the mornings before their regular day begins, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all bending over backwards to try to service people, especially in my profession, they are in need. They are in terrible need of this kind of service. Well, I have to agree. I, you did leave out one complaint that I heard from one of my friends lately, who I've never met in person, by the way. We've just met through networking on Zoom. <laughs> she was on a Zoom networking call <laughs> and a man <laughs> got up to do something and he was in his boxers. <laughs> 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 she, she, she was appalled and she was like nobody on that call is ever going to look at this guy the same way again. <laughs> it's unusual. but i have to tell you i've been on uh, maybe thousands of shows and i i have to say that very often when we're doing talking heads nobody knows that we're wearing undies underneath. <laughs> nobody knows that. And you think you can get away with it, but every once in a while you have an oops. Yeah, so the other thing I wanted to say based on your comments was, I got to tell you, I do a lot of Zoom calls. I do Zoom interviews for my business. It is such a relief to do a regular phone call. <laughs> I got to tell you. That's yeah, right. And then, so you work with corporations, but what Richard found when he started his law firm, we both came from corporate, was that a lot of corporate ideas and procedures translate across all size business and we've incorporated them in your heart law. So what do you say to entrepreneurs about their relationship skills based on what you say to corporations? Well, you know, it's, it's the same exact thing. As a matter of fact, this is why I do relationship counseling and I also do relationship strategy work in companies because it's all the same. I didn't even know I had this kind of business going when I first started out. Um, a client said, oh, you have helped me so much, Dr. Gilda, with my personal relationship. I said, what are you talking about? We're in this big company. 
And I said, what are you talking about? I don't think I've ever mentioned your personal relationship. He said, it's all the same. And he pointed to me something that I hadn't even realized. Here I was doing all this corporate work and I hadn't realized the need to co-mingle the interpersonal relationships that we have at home with the interpersonal relationships that we have for the bottom line. Because everything, every dysfunction, every wart, every pimple you have going on at home is going to spill over to the business that you're supposedly doing. So you can't help but seg, but but join those two together. And and heretofore, we have always been told that leave your personal stuff at home and we have to only worry about business things at work. And yet empathy raised, raised, uh, rated very, very high as something that companies are looking towards in their people. Years ago, you never heard that. When I started teaching MBA courses, nobody was allowed to talk about empathy, but now this is the word. So wow. things have, the, the lines of demarcation have truly blurred and you cannot seg segment your personal from your professional. So I have, I have had by dint of necessity to service both of these aspects. So Dr. Gilda, that's such an interesting point. And I wanted to ask you, how do you counsel couples who are both working, who have stressful jobs, uh, especially if they're working from home now, how do you counsel them to interact so they're just not totally on each other's nerves or, um, they, and how do they maintain the relationship under these kinds of circumstances? Well, here's where planning has got to come in. Very, very specific planning. You say to the kids, look, this is going to be where you're going to do your homework. And you say to him and you say to her, this is where you're going to do your work. This is where I'm going to be doing my work. And of course, there's always trespassing. So everybody's nerves are raw and on edge. And we have to get them to take a back seat and just breathe and understand you have one roof and lots of personalities underneath that roof. And how are you gonna get along? Now in the past, these interpersonal relationships, we didn't even know people weren't getting along because you had the buffer of work. You, you saw each other in the morning, you saw each other at night, and, and all of a sudden with pandemic, you're looking at each other and saying, who is this person? You barely know them, you barely know your children. And it's, it's, it's an eye opener that when people start to find out who they're relating to, some of them say, I'm out of here. Some of them have called their lawyers. Some of them have called me, listen, I need some emergency work to do with you. Uh, because they don't even know these people because we've been working and working and working so hard all these years. Well, I got to say, Richard has gone into the office every single day because we have the building. So he kicked everybody else out and I've worked from home. <laughs> so, but I, I, know, I know Kenya Wait has- Wait a minute, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah, I know Kenya has something to say. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was thinking about what you were saying in regards to relationships to other people and how that's changed since everybody's been quarantined and working from home. But one of the things I thought of while you were saying that was like the relationships with ourselves, right? Oh, so yeah. I, I think that that has changed so much because we're in solitude. We don't have people around us to kind of distract ourselves from ourselves. So how would you say that has shifted and changed since people have been quarantining and working from home? I am so glad you brought that up because the most important relationship that we have with anybody starts with us. And you cannot say, I am an entrepreneur unless you capitalize that I. Because if you are saying, well, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm working from home and this is, you know what? We attract not who we want, but who we are. We attract whatever we put out. So if you're attract, so if you're coming across with a lowercase I, 
you're going to be attracting lowercase losers in love, in, in at work. You are just going to keep <laughs> attracting all these people with similar lowercase eyes. So in order, the antidote to get ri getting rid of all the people that you're attracting and you can't understand why is to make yourself a capital I. I have a capital I on my door before I leave every day. And people say, what is that? Why, 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 why do you have that capital I? I said, because I have triplet nieces. Now they're 10 years old. And when they leave, I say, where are you? Where's that capital I? Now I have done this training with salespeople, with, with entrepreneurs, with women's groups, with so many different people. And you'd be surprised when I say to a live audience and the, remember those? When I say <laughs> to a live audience, uh, okay, let me see your capital I. All of a sudden you see people start to levitate because they're thinking so much better about themselves. I remember training a group of female entrepreneurs in Manhattan and there was standing room only. I was doing this training and standing room only. And I said to them, okay, now we're gonna do the power stare. And they, they were lined up after we had to send them out after breakfast, it was a breakfast meeting. And I said, do you think Manhattan will ever be the same after this? <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. But it all begins, Kenya, perfect question. It all begins with us. And if we're no good for us, then that's where we start. We are not going to maintain healthy relationships at business or at home with our children, with our neighbors, with anybody, until we really spend time on that. And I can't tell you how many uh, seminars I have run with entrepreneurial men who have sat there and said, well, I'm not getting a raise and I'm not getting a this and I'm not getting, and my boss, and, I, and all I do is say, have you ever had this conversation with your boss? And the men, have never been trained to ask for what they want or ask for what they believe they deserve. And, they'll, and they said to me, the boss should know. And I, <laughs> yeah, and I, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I get the power stare too. So, um, <laughs> but um, no, that's, 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 that's really fascinating. So what makes for a good relationship? Well, haven't we all seen when somebody says in a personal relationship, well, you should know how I feel. Well, what are you, Svengali? How is that person supposed to <laughs> Come on, you can't expect somebody to just know exactly what's in your head. You've got to say this. And we are reluctant to share our feelings for fear of being hurt. And when I start even my media coaching, I say to a client, what are your feelings and what are your fears? And most of them will say, I don't, know, I don't have any feelings or fears. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and then we do our work. <laughs> so do you deal with individuals as well? Do you coach just individuals or is it just groups? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, lots of individuals and a lot of, I, I'm, I do that internationally. So a lot of my individuals, some are, one is running a country. Another is, and they love using me because I'm out of the country and I, nobody can find me. So, uh, you know, then they're, they're not going to be followed by the media. Uh, one, uh, another is an attorney in another country Another, I mean, I could go on and on and on. And it's wonderful what we can do online. I never thought the online would work, frankly. But wow, you are so intense. And in 30 minutes, man, I could get started and, and, and wind somebody up and push them out the door to feel that much better. Can you teach us the power stare virtually? Is that something? <laughs> <laughs> I sure can. That is also, by the way, in my book, Don't Bet on the Prince, which I have used. It's been published in so many different languages across the world. And I have used that in my MBA programs as well, because while it sounds like it's a woman's self-help book, because the subtitle says how to have the man you want by betting on yourself. 
it really has been as I have applied this information to how to have the job you have by betting on yourself, how to have the career you have by betting on yourself. Everything has to be betting on you first. And the power stare is like this. You stare at somebody. Now, I, I don't know if you'll be able to see this all that well on this camera, but I'm staring at somebody. I turn my head a little bit. I continue to stare. And then I fold my head down just a little bit. Oh, I'm going to practice that. Let me show you something. I think I got it down. I, I, well, I, I think my cat my... uses that on me. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what it's called. <laughs> I started my career as a 20-year-old teaching in the South Bronx, the worst neighborhood in the world. Love the kids, but oh, goodness. The neighborhood was terrible, and uh, the administrators didn't know what they were doing. And so I did everything. I never colored inside the, 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 the lines. I always colored outside the box. I always did wild and weird things. And my kids were not, were not reading. They weren't writing. They were totally illiterate. And I had them reading newspapers by the time they ended their classes because I didn't accept mediocrity in any way. That is an absolutely wonderful story. And we have to take a commercial break right now. Uh, what we'll, We hope that you'll stick around and, and uh, help give advice to some of our other uh, uh, presenters and, and guests. So And us. And us, <laughs> yes. I'm, 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 I'm going to use that I'm not power beyond stare advice. back at the cat now <laughs> next time. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on WOR 710, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Welcome back, everybody. Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Our special guest this evening is uh, Dr. Gilda Carl, and we just heard from her. And if you hadn't had a chance to hear her presentation, of course, available on our podcast, you can get it on the iHeartRadio app. You can get it on any major uh, podcast platform, and you can also find it on our Passage to Profit website. So and our YouTube channel. So if you want to see what's going on and see people's expressions, et cetera, go to our YouTube channel, Passage to Profit. Uh, it's kind of fun to watch everybody. Yeah. And uh, so if you're listening on the radio right now and you haven't got that power stare down just right yet, <laughs> uh, we recommend that you, you go to the YouTube channel. You can get the full effect. So that said, on to our next segment. We're going to do a little bit something different this time with our executive spotlight. Uh, we have our friend, uh, Jim Barode, who's been with us uh, the whole entire way. I've known Jim for a long, long time. Uh, he's currently an advisor to uh, entrepreneurs, to VCs, uh, that's venture capital groups. Uh, he's a prominent part of the ecosystem here. I'm really thrilled to have him on the program, and he's going to be uh, discussing financial uh, information with Len Green, who's the master of all things financial. So I'm going to turn things over to Jim. Jim, welcome to the show, and uh, we look forward to uh, jamming with you on financial issues for entrepreneurs. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me, both Richard and Elizabeth, and, and Kenya, too. Um, you know, I used to run an entrepreneurship center for many years. So I've met hundreds, if not thousands of, of entrepreneurs. I used to run a, a tech uh, technology trade association for, for f over five years. So I've met literally thousands of entrepreneurs. And one of the most successful entrepreneurs I know is Len Green. And uh, I'm so delighted he's joining us today because he can share with all of you some really good advice, especially as we go through this very difficult time. So first I wanna ask Len, Len, talk to us about your amazing background and tell us about you know, some challenge you overcame. Well, I gotta tell you, if, if, if I had learned how to stare, imagine how much more successful I could have been. Instead of being a billionaire, I could have been a multi-billionaire. <laughs> And to go back on, on, on something that we, we started talking about before is I really believe that you shouldn't let COVID-19 go unattended, okay? Yes, it's bad, 
but it opens up so many new opportunities for people, especially people who have worked for other people and have seen things that they knew that they could do better. Well, this gives you a golden opportunity to actually try and start a business because there can't be any better time to do it, okay? But yeah, you have to learn new skills, okay? And part of it is the skill of being able to project yourself and, and talk. But you gotta be saying to yourself, hey, what's out there that I think I can do differently than what's being done today, okay? And if you can do that, then I think you got the first step. And then you gotta take that next step which is self-confidence. Well, I don't know, I'm comfortable being an employee. Should I keep on doing that? And the answer is, hey, if you think you have something that's different, and if you think you can then set up some kind of barriers to entry with this new idea, be it a, a patent or be it, you know, that something like that, or first in to, to do it with, okay? If you see a problem out there, you go solve it. And what I used to do was, I used to walk up and down the aisles of a supermarket and say, hey, what's out there? Could I find something that I could do differently than what's out there before? I'll give you an example, okay? Let's say you have a dog or cat. Well, a lot of people have dogs and cats. It's a big industry. You look down the aisle and 85 to 90% of the cans of dog food, cat food were selling for 75 cents to $1.25. And you say to yourself, yeah, but that's junk in there. Okay, it causes a lot of cancer. What happens if you had a $3 can, okay, which was pure? Could you attract enough people to buy that $3 can instead of the dollar crap that was, was down there? Okay, and if you could, then think of all the profitability you might be able to get by selling and all the good you could get by stamping out cancer, okay? And that's what Bill Bishop and, and others thought of, and I invested in them. And the end result was blue buffalo dog food, cat food, which was eventually sold for billions of dollars, okay? It's the idea of something different and then having the courage to be able to do it and then having the out-of-the-box thinking of it, okay? So I think it's an all combination, but I think what, what Dr. Gill said before is you gotta have confidence. How many people said to us, you're crazy. All the big companies out there that are selling dog food, cat food are all listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange. How are you ever going to get to be able to compete against them? And if you have the confidence that you have something different that is good for mankind, okay? And yeah, you had to convince families that dogs and cats were not dogs and cats. They were members of a family. And if they're members of a family, well, that's a different thing. We'll spend anything we can for members of a family versus the dogs and cats. And then there's great stories about how you get into the big boxes, okay, differently, okay, that other thing. But again, it's this thinking outside the box and it's confidence in yourself that you can present something. And then you got to be able to present it, okay? You got to be able to rocket pitch and do things differently and along those kind of lines. But again, don't let this crisis go to waste because I'm sure that there's many people out there who see things, who say, hey, I could do it differently. And there's so many examples of that. that. I mean, for instance, there was, there was a young lady who was working in a florist shop and she went to her boss and said, hey, I think we could sell flowers, okay, not in the, in the shop, but we can deliver them. He said, no, you can't start a delivery service, okay? How about Walmart, okay? They said, hey, I think we can have stores outside the big cities. No, it'll never work. Yeah, I think kind of it worked a little bit. Kind of thing. So again, Jim, okay, the, 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 I think the great thing about teaching also, okay, and Jim gave you my first teaching job, okay, uh, was the fact that you sit and listen to what the students come up with and they don't know what you can't do. Okay, so they come up with all these ideas kind of thing. And I steal them, okay, and start with businesses. And we started 20 different companies in, in, in our life. <laughs> because I think it's very, very in, in, important to, to, to do that. The next step, Jimmy, is, is I don't believe you should be running your own companies, okay? I really believe that if you can surround yourself 
with people smarter than you. And for me, it's easy. Okay. And then listen to them and empower them. An awful lot of great things can happen kind of thing because they, they're mentally then not employees. They're mentally part of management. And if you can get everybody thinking management wise and they're, they have this confidence of they can come to you and say, hey, you're not Mr. Green, the boss. You're Len. And I, we can tell them things. I think it's really great. I'll give you another example. Okay. Uh, I, I, I was advising a, a beverage company. Okay. It was called South Beach. You never heard of South Beach before, but it was a great idea because it was a, a beverage with, uh, with a mermaid on it and, and uh, et cetera kind of thing. And it reminded you of South Beach and vacations. It just tasted awful. And we were ready to close the shop up. Okay. And somebody from the mailroom said, why don't you call it Sobe instead? Okay. And, and make it really fun for the, 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 the people our age. Boom. <laughs> so there are ideas that come from everybody. As long as you can listen to the ideas and don't, and don't say this is a wall. And again, you got to have some barriers to entry. Once you start something, whether it's the patent, et cetera, it's some who are first to market. Once you're there, Okay, you can, you can then keep on improve, improving on it. Now is the best time to start a business. That absolutely is. And uh, we always tell people just get started, just do it. But for those entrepreneurs, those small businesses that are struggling now, I know you obviously have so many businesses, including accounting. So you know best what they can do, at least financially speaking, to get through this period uh, this difficult period, you know, as they're pivoting, as they're trying new things. What do you recommend for those small businesses currently? Okay, number one, okay, number one, don't have a partner that has that takes forty percent of, 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 of your profits. And you say to me, well, who does that? Well, if you're paying taxes, okay, you have a partner, the IRS, and it's taking forty percent of your profits. That should never happen. With the, you can plan and do things. Even before the end of the year, there's so many things that you can set up. You can buy things on credit, and, and yet you can get a 100% deduction. You can set up pension plans that you don't have to fund for the next 10 months, but it counts as being December 31st, having have it done. Okay, you can, you can, These are things that you can think about doing, but do it, the planning now so that you don't waste okay, the deductions. Okay. Number two, okay, you can you got to look at what you're doing and say, wait a second, am I doing the same thing I did last year? And if I didn't make money last year, that that's I'm, I'm an idiot. Why do the same thing and expect a different result? You got to do some better strategy on this thing, okay? And, and so, Jim, I think there's an awful lot of things you can do between now and the end of the year, okay, so that you don't run into the problem of paying taxes. And then two, can you do things differently than you were doing before? Because if you can do things differently, you got an advantage. And three, I really believe you look at your competition and say, what are they doing? And can I do it better than they can do it? The, the biggest example, Jim, is this. You're having a problem with your business and you call up your accountant or lawyer or advisor. Okay, maybe they've never been through COVID-19. They can't be, have been through COVID-19. And yet they're giving you advice possibly on what the world used to be. And the world is different. I love what he said about having the courage to pursue the idea that has come to you. If you don't, somebody else, it will be in the ethers somehow and somebody else is gonna pick up on that fabulous idea and they're going to pursue it. And you'll say, oh my God, if only I woulda, coulda, shoulda. All of these things have been said again and again and again. If only I had acted on. And nobody's going to act on anything unless they have the courage to do so. And that all starts with capital I. Who are you? What, you, what do you want? What do you believe you deserve? Very little is put into what you believe you deserve in your education. For me, the biggest thing was, what happens if I fail? And I say, wait a second, maybe I'm not failing. If I learned something from what I did, even if it went wrong, then I'm not failing. And That's then 
That's one of my gildograms. Oh. There are no failures. There are only lessons in what to do <laughs> next. Quote. I, we talk about uh, intellectual property all the time with new clients and they all have the same concerns. What if it doesn't work out? And they'll say, well, uh, and, and for, for a lot of clients, a patent is a big part of their entrepreneurial budget. And so they'll, they'll say, well, what if it doesn't work out? And I'll say, well, you've learned something about yourself. Maybe the entrepreneurial world isn't for you, or you get a better understanding of how businesses work. Because if you're an employee, you may only get uh, a piece of, uh, of the organization. But if you're the CEO, you have to consider a lot of different things. And so, you know, I don't think even if it doesn't work out uh, for the for the entrepreneur, they gain personally from it. I wouldn't say it doesn't work out because I think it always works out with that kind of attitude. Well, what if it doesn't work out? Nobody would get married. Nobody would have children. No <laughs> yeah, I just was curious to know, you know, besides an idea being a solution, right? A good solution. What are some other signs that you have a good idea? The best thing is if you put it on the market and it sells. I mean, a lot of awful lot of people spend an awful lot of money, okay, on focus groups. And to me, it's a complete waste of time because the focus groups tell you what they think you want to hear because they, they, they don't want to hurt your feelings. Okay, it's just something along with what wait, 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 people just said. You got to have the courage and possibly the money, okay, to get your product out into the marketplace, okay? Even if you do this, and, and again, a number of companies that I've had, okay, we set up little stands outside of supermarkets, et cetera, kind of thing, and give out free food just to test it to see whether or not people will do it. And then if they like it, well, then we go into the store and say, hey, we really think if you took our product, okay, here's the marketplace that we've already established to, to, to do it with. But you got to have thick skin. You can't say, hey, if it failed, I, I failed. No, you haven't. The, 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 the key to my success, okay? And, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate. Okay, I, I, I've had a lot of companies go public and do things with kind of thing. Is is my wife believe it or not? Because she tells me what it is. She says I don't like this or I like it, and here's the reason why. Or why the hell did you invest in that company? For? And, and I have to explain it to her. And that's a great feedback kind of thing because it's honest feedback. And that's why I say surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Empower them because they will give you honest feedback. Listen to the people around you. You don't need the focus groups. If people feel that you have something of value to them, and that's all you're interested in, giving something of value to them. If they feel that, they have, that you have something, they will buy it or at least buy into considering it. And, wow. And you, the, the, the other great thing was we, we, we used to do this we used to say hey if you like our product okay send me something that says why you like it or don't like it and we'll give you free coupons okay and if you really like it okay we'll give you double free coupons if you recommend it to somebody else len how can people find you i would think the best way to find me is l green at greencode.com that's perfect well, thanks so much, Len, for being on the program. Uh, uh, fantastic advice. I was mem mesmerized by um, all of your excellent insights, and we really appreciate you having you here. We'll be back with more Passage to Profit right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, our special guests e this evening, uh, Dr. Gilda, and also Len Green, uh, who has been uh, just absolutely fantastic. Uh, he's given to a lot of charities uh, in cooperation with Passage to Profit. Elizabeth will say a little bit more about that later. But right now, we're on to Kenya Gibson and her weekly Power Move segment. So Kenya, what do you have teed up for us tonight? Well, I think this power move is going to fit so perfectly because we talked with Dr. Gilda earlier about the power stare, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so this past weekend, we had literally a historic fight in boxing. Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson came out of retirement. They had an exhibition fight. 
and it was very entertaining and they prepared and they trained. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that Natalyn Jones, who is Roy Jones wife's junior's wife, she has a new uh, warrior, she warrior line that's out where it's all about women empowerment. So it's at the leisure clothing that empowers and helps women find the fighter that's within them. So I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about her and, and you know, her being a fearless champion. She, you know, she's a very kind of behind the scenes type of person. A lot of people don't know that she's an active boxing promoter and she wanted to kind of create a line for women that really empowered them and really helped them, you know, find their voice in a very male dominated space. So she has a passion for boxing, runs through her family, and She Warrior is all about women finding their power, tapping inside, and really just, you know, taking their, their gifts and their talents to the next level, whether it be through boxing or everyday life. So you want to check out what her line looks like. It's imshewarrior.com. I actually have some of the clothing already. Um, it's super comfortable. It does make you feel very empowered. Um, and I wanted to highlight her because I think that's a serious power move when you can take something that's pa you're passionate about and turn it into opportunities for other women. Yeah, that's great. And I know you're like a, a workout fanatic, right? You're a trainer and you've done a lot of working, you know, you can do a lot of classes and uh, I've seen you on Instagram, you know, doing those uh, classes where everybody's like, punching each other, right? Uh, but not physically, they're sort of doing it, um, you know, dancing around to music and stuff. So yeah, uh, I'll say that I'm a, I'm a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. I was somebody who once struggled with weight for a very good portion of my life and have found through teaching fitness that that was just an, a level of accountability for, for me that's allowed me to kind of transform. And I'm still in my process. So, you know, I've cut down a lot of my weight and, and have really been trying all different kinds of things to, you know, find the best version of myself, which I think we all should strive to do. Kenya, I believe we're all in our process. There is no end. There is no end in sight and there never will be because then how would we continue to want to get better and better and better? So I think we're all in our process and that's a beautiful thing. So thank you for that, Kenya. And Elizabeth, tell us what's going on in your world, Fireside and otherwise. Okay, before I get into my Fireside directory update, I do want to talk a little bit about giving, giving to charity. So we changed a little bit with our executive spotlight on Passage to Profit, and we have asked people who come on as an executive spotlight to donate to charity for being on the show. And then we'll highlight that in our social media. So, so Gilda has told us she has a charity, countrycures.org, that helps women veterans get back into society in a very successful way. That's a beautiful charity. Uh, Len Green, we asked him to donate to one charity. He donated to five. <laughs> <laughs> he donated to Rainforest Trust, which is awesome. Uh, Fisher Center for Alzheimer's Research Foundation. Len also don donated to Action Against Hunger. He donated to the American Humane Society. And then one that is near and dear to our hearts, Students to Science. Students, the number two science, which helps students from underprivileged communities learn a little bit about science in a hands-on laboratory environment. A very powerful program. I've gone there as a volunteer and helped the students do the experiments. And uh, we really love all of these charities. Well, let's go ahead and, and add one more for St. Jude and one more for Gilda's charity, because those, those, those are beautiful. They really, really are. Oh, thank you, Len. So yes, yeah, so <laughs> for Christmas this year, you know, what do I need? I sit at home on Zoom all day. <laughs> um, so I asked Richard to get me a recurring donation to St. Jude's. St. Jude's is a research association and treatment center for children with cancer. You may get a few other things besides that. <laughs> I probably will. But I love St. Jude's. It was founded by Danny Thomas, who was an entertainer, and he made a deal with God. If you make me successful, I'll start this hospital. Yeah, I thought, well, you know, that's that's a, a great motivation, right? And, and it, we can use all the help we can. So right. he asked the right person. And St. Jude is the patron, patron saint of hopeless causes. So for parents who don't have any money and have a child with cancer and it seems hopeless, it's not. You can go there. 
I had an opportunity to visit Memphis to go to the hospital one year when I was with iHeart before. And it, I got to tell you, you know, the strength of the children that are there, oh. you know, it's like, I, I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. So, you know, you would think there, you go there, you know, expecting to feel sad, which you do. But when you see them and you see how well taken care of the families are, not one of the families pays a dime to be there and neither do the children. Um, all their care is taken care of, uh, care of through donations. So it's a beautiful organization. And if you ever get an opportunity to visit, um, it's, it's very empowering. What's wonderful. Yes. Th so, thank you. So what's going on with Fireside? So for those of you who haven't heard of Fireside before, it's Fireside Directory. It is an online video directory of small business around the world. I have somebody from London on there and people from Canada, uh, as well as people from the United States. I started it right before COVID hit doing videos in a studio where I interviewed business owners about their businesses and then put those on my YouTube channel and on my website. And I want it to be a big directory. And then COVID hit and now what? Well, it actually helped, you know, as Len was saying, take COVID and make uh, lemonade out of lemons. So people got more used to being on screen and I was able to talk people into doing these business videos with me. Mark, who's going to be on next, has done one. Kenya's done one. And it's an interview process. So people that feel very uncomfortable talking to a camera are talking to a person. And I was able to convince through different people to a lot of people. So I have over a hundred videos now. I've been working on it for nine months or so. And they're on my YouTube channel, which is the second most searched engine after Google. And also the website I'm building, I want to be the Wikipedia of small business and medium business on video. And I take any business owner who wants to come on. And now I've gotten it to a certain level. Some people just will never be on video. Like one man I spoke to, of course, there's compliance problems. So I'm taking a corporate video of his and putting it on his page on the website. So I really want this to be a tech project, not so much of me interviewing. I've got other people to do some interviews for me and to work with me on that but I want it to be the Wikipedia of small business on video. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Wikipedia is the highest ranked web page on Google because of all the content. There you go. So our goal is to make uh, small business videos uh, even more popular than Wikipedia. So um, we will we'll, see. We'll get there. We're going to get there. So um, why don't we get to our guest presenters now? Oh, okay. As I said, I interviewed Mark Cantor with instigate.ai for Fireside. And Mark has just, he's cutting edge. He's above cutting edge. I don't know what you <laughs> So anyway. He's with that, beyond the cutting he's edge. Beyond. He's like the Star Trek guy. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Mark, why don't you tell us about instigate.ai? Well, thank you very much. And it's honored to be on the same show with Dr. Gilda and Len. Uh, Len, everything you say, dude, that's what it's all about. It's about value. It's about differentiating yourself, about being first to market. So I'm an old school software entrepreneur. I've been doing this for 40 years since the beginning of the software industry. And I started a company called Macromind. That became Macromedia. So if you've ever heard of Flash, that was my company. Billions of dollars of value was created. That doesn't mean that the venture capitalists didn't uh, you know, screw me over, but that's that's just why I'm broke today, right? Because people think that if you've been an entrepreneur and your company went public, you're permanently rich. But in, in fact, the ride of the entrepreneur is like a roller coaster, okay? So I, my last company ended up in a lawsuit. What did I do? I started another company. It was in the field of artificial intelligence. You might have heard of this hustle. It's out there. Trillions of dollars are being invested in it. The problem is that the average normal person isn't a programmer or a data scientist or a mathematician. How do we allow normal people to get involved with AI? How do they learn? Well, what we've done is we've got a new kind of tool that is actually kind of like a game. They start at level one and they start to create interactive stories that use AI. And then they share those stories with their friends. And of course, everybody's got an aspirational ambition. So our social model is you first start and you create what we call a being. We don't call them bots because bots are evil. 
We call them beings because those are nice and warm and fuzzy. And so you create this being and it's a conversation. And you try it out yourself. You, you put something into the conversation and there's a little script editor. And then you try it out. And then you add some more to the conversation. And you script out a conversation. And what you're doing is you're using videos and photos and music and animation. And because it's all about the cell phone, right? It's all about uh, media. Now, when I listen to my daughter talk, She's talking about gossiping and this cute guy in school. And they each have their own language. And so our AI, instead of it being something that the company defines, which is why chat bots and all these things are so evil, what we're doing is allowing the creator to create their own language that they share with their posse. So part one is you create this being. The next stage is you share it privately. So our social model is that you can just go and create something to share it privately. You don't have to go public and you know spew it all over the world. And so you create this private experience and your friends interact with her, okay? And you ask a question. So you're watching the story played out and it's in the form of a messaging app because we all recognize that there's a little text field along the bottom you're supposed to type into it. So you watch this story unfold, but during the story, you can ask questions of the story. Is this uh, in the beta stage or is this? Uh... Well, we're, yeah, we're still working on it. And it's okay. something Len can appreciate. We've built this whole product. We've been working on it for four years. We've been testing it, creating prototypes. We've done it with no money. So would you characterize this as entertainment then? Is that what... Ab Absolutely. Okay. It's so funny because my lawyer people hear about it, like this is great for health and this will be great for business well yeah that's true but you got to get the essence of the value first this is a completely new thing no one's ever seen this before now i'm glad you brought up money because it's all about follow the money right and who is going to really use this product celebs and brands because they're constantly looking for a new way to differentiate themselves to stand up from the crowd they call it fomo Fear of missing out. So what we've got is what happens after TikTok, right? I mean, you know, TikTok is these short little form videos. That's all cool. Everyone's used to doing that. But what I'm about is what happens next. It's like having a bot, but you train it to answer in your own voice, right? So it's kind right, of- your You have your own language that, that you develop, that you and your posse get, you know, it's for you. So it's a personalized animated figure of yourself. Not animated. We are appearance agnostic. Now that allows us to partner with all these little 3D talking heads. We could insert our stories into Fortnite or into you know, Metaverse. We could work with other ads in the, the world because you see the celebs and brands, they're constantly looking for a new way. They're locked into the Facebook and Instagram and YouTube world. What they want to do is route around and get right to their customers, right? So what we've got is a new kind of publishing platform. And for, for instance, Mexican avocados is not going to do any ads in the Super Bowl this year. They don't need to. They have a list of 80 million names, okay? So they can get directly to their customers. So our publishing platform allows these celebs and brands to create a unique experience, unique storytelling experience, and go right to their customers. Now, where it gets really cool is that within the story, you know, because it's all about these short little videos, right? These short form videos and a little thing here, and you watch a TV ad, and it's all about these little quick cuts, okay? So in our being, you can go into the being and copy an individual piece of the being and paste it into your being. So you can get the Popeye's dancing chicken sandwich, go over to the Tesla thing, the car driving this way. Then you got the Nike sneaker over there. Then you got the toothbrush doing this. And you can copy in all these segments, put it into your being and create your own being real quick and then share it with your friends. Kenya does digital marketing type of work, creative work for iHeart. Kenya, what do you think about this? Oh, is it like product pr placement and integration in your own personal type of story? Is that what it is? If you want to, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think of it as like a, a personal diaries or gossip or something where you're going to use it for fun and entertaining things. And for instance, you're, you're going along and uh, you're watching a story and your friends ask, wait, wait, I know that guy. And, just, and you know, it's looking for, and you've trained it to say, 
Frank, Henry, Joe, and Steve, you know? And so your friends are all gossiping about these guys. And you say, well, is that Joe? You know, and then you've got different responses. If you say Joe, you do this. But if you say Frank, you do that, right? And so it's a whole interactive story. I was going to say, so brands would use this as interactive advertising. So like, for example, I'm LeBron James, right? And I create this like storyboard. And I can- And within the LeBron James world, he's got- He's helping out folks in Akron. He's got the story of his rings. He's got his aspirations. He's got his organizations he's helping with, okay? And so as people interact with the LeBron being, different things are coming up out of it, right? And it's kind of, you're exploring through the being, discovering what's in there. It sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm sorry, Dr. Gilda, did you have a question or? No, I love it. It's, it's Thank you. I, I think of so many opportunities for interpersonal relationships with that. And you're so right. Everybody wants to speak in their own language. And when they speak to other people, they they want a similarity of language. And yeah. so this is this is very interesting to me. What pisses me off is when I look at the existing tools out there, they're very condescending, they're very limiting. Oh, look, I can put text right there. I can put an icon. I mean, I've got these young teenage daughters and I don't want to limit them. I want to give them the most sophisticated, powerful tools they can. Mark, you really have something, okay, which I'm not sure that, that you even realize yet. Okay, we, we, we've spent millions of dollars with our companies over the years to see what, how you can get the attention of people for 30 seconds, a, a rocket pitch, et cetera, kind of thing. And, and the answer is always show them something that they've seen before that they recognize, and then they'll listen to the message. And, yeah. and you have that in, yeah. in, in this platform. So Jim so, has a lot of experience with this. I, I just want to, you know, you've gone through the experience with Macromedia. What do you see as your exit strategy for this venture? It's always important for entrepreneurs to understand where they're going. Yeah. And how they'll ultimately... Uh... So, so we've got a five-year roadmap. This is going to be a billion-dollar company. It's going to spread like crazy because it is a DIY creator platform. Okay? So there's three things going on here. First, it has to be a completely new way to express. Okay? Whole new thing. There's a there there. Okay? Second, you got a way, a, a way to make money. And what I'm doing is recreating the phenomena that I did 35 years ago, where people who use our product can make a living. And finally, this is a way for people to learn about artificial intelligence, about AI. How do you do that? By doing it. This goes wide and deep. There's a lot more to this. You just touched the tip of the iceberg. If anybody wants to talk to Mark some more about this, and kids are using it, it's fun. Um, yeah. It's... Um, Instigate.ai. AI stands for artificial intelligence. And please get a hold of him. And that's his website. We will be back after this break. You are listening to Passage to Profit, the inventor. Thank you. <laughs> With Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, our special guest, Dr. Gilda Carl, and our executive spotlight, Len Green. And if you're just tuning in now to the radio, listening to this, wow, you need to hear the podcast when it comes out tomorrow because we have had one of the best shows ever and I'm not making that up. So we'll be right back after this message. Welcome back listeners. We are to the last presenter on our show. Last but certainly not least, I am so impressed with this life-saving device. I can hardly wait to hear more about it. Welcome Arthur Lee with lifeback.net. I mean, I'm a two-time entrepreneur. Uh, I wish I had uh, Mr. Green's advice early on in my life, but uh, the first time I was uh, basic, uh, I would say your uh, classic entrepreneur. I started in uh, on the freight dock. I, uh, over 18 years, I worked through the business, developed my own company, sold it, uh, knew the answer to how many boats you can water ski behind, and uh, it's one. So <laughs> I, I had uh, retired um, I had heard of a child that choked to death the same age as my daughter. Uh, just love of my life. She was seven. And uh, I started to understand that the current procedures, the Heimlich doesn't always work. And when I understood further, as I researched how often it doesn't work, uh, I looked to buy something to be able to save her should that incident occur. 
Uh, one child dies every five days from choking. It's a leading cause of accidental death on the 14th. So it is the fourth leading cause of accidental death overall. So uh, as Mr. Green had said, you find a need and you fill it. Well, I had the need to save my daughter. So uh, I experimented and uh, worked and invented a very simple device that can clear an airway. Um, I did it for her. And then uh, I prayed and I understood that I needed it. Uh, I couldn't be the only daddy to save his daughter. So uh, I brought it to market. Uh, and that was almost 10 years ago. And yesterday we got word of saving four children in one day. So wow. yesterday we saved four children. So and are people buying these for their homes then? Yeah, we, uh, the majority of our customers are parents, uh, particularly parents that uh, have a child and an elderly that they take care of. Uh, we see fire departments, police departments, schools, but the, the majority of our core is parents like me. For our listeners who are uh, listening to us on the radio, uh, can you describe how it works and what it looks like? My goal was to find something simple, inexpensive, easy to use, panic proof, and uh, available. So basically it's a little plunger. Uh, if you ever had a sink plunger, that's what it is. Uh, you push it down and compress it. Uh, it creates the air vents out the side so it can't push the object further in. There's a face mask that goes over your face to create the seal to your face. A quick tug, the suction is created and sucks the object out of your uh, upper airway. And so this has been approved by the FDA, right? Yeah, well, that's one of the great myths uh, in the impossible journey that I felt necessary to take on. Uh, LifeVac is FDA registered. Every suction device in the United States is uh, FDA registered. And uh, that is the classification and proper area for a LifeVac. So if someone says, oh, it's not FDA registered, that's because they don't quite understand the way the FDA works. So how does this work a kid starts going and choking on something my daughter was holding some grape sized magnets above her mouth with her mouth wide open and i came screaming into the room and luckily she dropped them elsewhere yes. but good move. Uh, so a kid starts choking what happens next well typically uh most of the 90 saves uh protocol has been done your kid's choking you back slap them you you compress his chest uh, called an abdominal thrust. Uh, look at Mrs. Doubtfire, right? You get behind them and you give them a good toss. It's a baby. You smack their back. The problem is that it only works in a layperson environment 50% of the time. Yeah. And if a paramedic was there, it would work 70% of the time. And the unfortunate other gigantic uh, myth to overcome, then you die because you only have four to eight minutes without air in your body. So you can do you can do CPR and you can call for help, but you're going to die if that object doesn't come out. And why the passion to save my daughter turned into the passion to save others. So do you go grab the device and stick it on their face and try to seal it around their nose and mouth? Or what do you do? Yeah, it's once again, it's think about a, a face mask that you would get anesthesia. Uh, it's on an ambu bag in there and any uh, ambulance covers your nose and mouth. You press the little plunger down, you give it a quick tug and it sucks the object right out of your airway and saves your life. Wow. I never knew that um, the Heimlich was so hit and miss. You know, over this years, I was an air freight guy, not a medical device specialist, but uh, I'm blessed that my sister's a doctor. My dad was an engineer, put a man on the moon. Uh, I believe that was a depth of an inspiration to attempt the impossible. Uh, problem why it's impossible is uh, numerous. Uh, one is the myth that the Heimlich always works. My daughter was born. I went down, took the course. They told me everything, and I said, all right, I'm good to go. Uh, very few people know how often it does not work. And 5,000-plus people a year choke to death uh, because we all think that it will work. Say, Arthur, I, I've done CPR and, you know, training, choking training, and I, I can't agree with you more that the body is not even really set up 
to really have impact like that. If you're thrusting, you could break a rib. There's so many things that you can do in the process of trying to, you know, give somebody the Heimlich maneuver. So I, I love what you've done with your innovation. I just, is, is some, the person standing up when you're doing this, are they laying down? <laughs> <laughs> a question for you, Arthur. If a tree falls in the forest and I don't hear it fall, did the tree actually fall in the, the forest? And my, my, my way of saying to you, that this almost sounds like a note, brainer. I mean, it really solves a real problem. That's a, that's a, a life-saving problem, but how do you get the word out? Okay. You've saved so many people so far, but I mean, this is the kind of thing that could save even greater amount. What are you doing to get the word out that you have this product? Well, we, uh, we have two huge uh, spends on uh, social media, Facebook uh, advertising, uh, been on numerous shows, uh, doctors, Fox and friends, the problem, believe it or not, is I made it too inexpensive and I made it last forever. So <laughs> our uh, friendly uh, lobbyists are not interested because it's too inexpensive and it lasts forever. In my generation, that was a good thing, uh, but it has prevented us from getting any kind of political support. Um, but the, you know, we also have a, we we're starting to generate basically life act warriors. One of the children that was saved yesterday was from a woman that was uh, a proponent of life act that did a little uh, segment on a lemonade stand that her kids uh, did to raise money to get it in the school. Yesterday's form, it said, how did you know about it? Her name. So because I can't get political support and I can't get, uh, you know, uh, celebrity support, uh, grassroots and uh, just dogged persistence. Leading cause of accidental death in children is choking. So you could get rid of your fire extinguishers. You get all rid of these things. I'm not saying you should, but if you prioritize your safety in your school, in your special needs facility, in your home, you would have a life act. It's lifeact.net. Now, I think that uh, Len, just looking at him on this, has a lot of fantastic ideas for you. And I think that it was fortuitous that you two are on the show together. So we are going to go to break and we'll come back with the wrap up. We'll go through everybody's websites again and who they were. This has been a great show. So you are listening to Passage to Profit, the inventor show with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guests, Dr. Gilda Carl and our executive spotlight, Len Green. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Passage to Profit, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. It has been a marvelous show. Hasn't amazing, it? amazing, amazing products, companies. Wow. People. All, all sorts of wonderful ideas and wonderful personalities. You never know what you're going to get on Passage to Profit, but um, we're glad it's that way. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, before we go, uh, why don't you wrap up for us? Okay. So our guest was Dr. Gilda Carl, drgilda.com. She is the go-to relationship strategist and performance coach. And if you haven't heard of her, then you've been living in a cave with a bag over your head. So, anyway, so, please. so she's been on the show. I've been in relationship with everyone. So I'm feeling <laughs> right now. And then um, our executive spotlight, just an incredibly brilliant entrepreneur is Len Green. And if you want to find him, it's L Green and green, just like the color at greenco.com and his website is greenco.com backslash team backslash team backslash len dash green and he's just made lots of money selling comp building companies and selling them and has incredible advice for entrepreneurs so seriously and, check him out and he's been very generous to the charities that right. passage to profit supports and he was yeah, he was interviewed by our good friend, Jim Baroud, who is a powerhouse in the entrepreneurial community here in the greater New York area. And then we had the stuff from sci-fi with Mark Canner, but this, <laughs> this is going to be huge. Your kids are all going to be using it. The celebrities are going to be saying, wow, I, I heard the guy that invented that. Um, Instigate.ai, it's artificial intelligence for everyone. It, you may not see it now, but like two years from now, it's going to be everywhere. Yep, we're one step closer to living in that big machine in the sky. And finally, we we had 
Arthur Lee, Saving One Choking Victim at a Time with LifeVac.net, something you can buy and have in your home. And if you have a child or an elderly relative who's choking, it vacuums the offending piece of material out of their throat. It's easy to use. It's small, easy to store, very convenient. He saved almost 90 lives with it so far. That really chokes me up, I just have to say. <laughs> and also Kenya Gibson, our iHeart Media Maven. If you have any digital marketing needs, including radio spots, it's much less expensive than TV. Kenya is the person to reach out to. It's Kenya Gibson with a P at iHeartMedia.com. Thank you, Kenya. Absolutely fantastic. And I'd also like to have a shout out for Noah Fleischman, our producer who just makes us all sound so wonderful. Thank you, Noah. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And also check out our YouTube channel. You can get more of our guests and you can get individual segments uh, of the program. And you can also take a look at their uh, projects and their products. So uh, thank you very much for joining us on Passage to Profit. You're listening to WOR 710, the voice of New York.